This week on Act Out, COP25 is over and the people have spoken. From Chile to Madrid, largely indigenous-led protests are highlighting the uselessness of these climate summits and the danger of falling for greenwashed false solutions in the age of climate chaos. Next, you've likely heard of fracking, but do you know about frac sand mining? Ted Ock from Frack Tracker takes us into this seldom discussed world of environmental destruction. From tweets to marching in the streets, this is Act Out. Welcome to Act Out. I'm Eleanor Goldfield, and this is your Tipping Point. The COP25 climate summit in Madrid wrapped late last week, and as suspected, nothing good came from the official proceedings. Indeed, the head of the Climate Action Network Canada described the meetings as Kafka-esque absurdity, where negotiators at one session spent 20 minutes arguing over whether to adjourn or close their meeting, and an equal amount of time debating whether to display items on a projection screen. Meanwhile, last Wednesday, some 500 people shut down the main hall of the COP25 in protests led by indigenous leaders slamming governments for their lack of action on climate chaos. This was the first time the UN meeting has been shut down via internal protests rather than protests taking place outside. Though thousands of miles away, activists in Chile echoed the frustrations and demands of those in Madrid as protests in Chile continue. The Global Justice Ecology Project put together this video featuring grassroots voices from Chile and the importance of not pedestaling false solutions put forward by the COP meetings. Take a look. Empresas forestales depredadoras, por ejemplo, acá del medio ambiente, que secan el territorio, que expropian y, y roban el agua, particularmente en el territorio Mapuche, son financistas, ¿no? Son aquellos que ponen los dólares para que esta cumbre se realizara en Santiago. Se entregaba la oportunidad de mostrar cómo el modelo neoliberal era capaz de absorber y dirigir el proceso de cambio climático con éxito, y asegurando a las empresas eh, que también podían ganar dinero en ella. Nosotros no somos los ingleses en Latinoamérica, no somos los jaguares, jamás lo hemos sido. Se vive un modelo de despojo, de explotación, de miseria, que ha atacado no solamente al pueblo de la nación mapuche, aquí en el Gualmapu, sino que hoy día eh, se ha develado que ataca a todo el territorio, a todo el pueblo chileno. Las mini centrales hidroeléctricas que se están queriendo instalar en los territorios, en las cuencas altas, desde el Bio Bio hasta los lagos. We are supporting these Mapuche communities which would be affected by the incinerator if it gets to be built. Uh, we delivered today more than 13,000 public observations against this project. It's the project with more public observations against it uh, since ever in Chile. Actualmente en nuestro territorio, desde la caída del proyecto, del megaproyecto hidroeléctrico Hidroaicer, es que todas las comunidades de este territorio han sido afectadas por extensos proyectos de mini centrales que afectan las cabeceras de Cuenca, con falsas promesas de, de progreso desde el Estado y desde las empresas. Se pretende construir una central. Lo que ustedes están viendo correr en este momento sería algo que dejaría de suceder en el caso que se llegara a construir. El hacer una central hidroeléctrica solamente yo creo que enriquece el bolsillo de algunos especialmente de los que más tienen en este país. Y para nosotros no es ninguna ganada que esto se instale en nuestros ríos. La familia Chaín está deforestando nuestra mapu, nuestra tierra. Estamos quedando sin esteros, sin canales, sin agua. Ellos el día de hoy han ingresado fuerzas especiales sin, sin previo diálogo, sin orden de desalojo. Empezaron a disparar lagrimógenas, de los cuales me llegó un, un rozo de, de perdigón. 
a no más de 15 metros. Desde las comunidades le decimos al Estado, si hoy día nos devuelven por vía institucional como es la ley, nosotros vamos a seguir haciendo ocupación directa. Para nosotros es algo súper malo, algo doloroso que destruyan nuestro río, nuestra naturaleza. Y si destruyen la naturaleza, lo están destruyendo a nosotros como mapuche. Lo que estamos viviendo es una crisis de la civilización termoindustrial y por lo tanto se determina una forma de cómo nosotros hemos tenido un progreso basado en energías que se están terminando como son la energía fósil. Actually, a lot of the environmental problems we are facing in a global level are because of the way of living of people in the developed countries. Es muy importante recuperar nuestro año quemado porque queremos vivir aquí donde vivieron nuestros ancestros, nuestros antepasados. Y lo central es que el capitalismo no va a poder seguir funcionando porque chocó con los límites, por un lado sociales, pero también con los límites ambientales, los, los límites que tiene el planeta. Es lindo sentirse mapuche, es un orgullo para mí y para mi gente igual. Nosotros queremos recuperar nuestro vivir mapuche, nuestro sentir mapuche, queremos nuestro, que nuestros hijos vivan en paz. Es importante que la humanidad tome conciencia de lo que está ocurriendo en nuestra tierra, en nuestro Gualmapu. Así que es por eso que hoy día, desde el más profundo espacio de la Ñuque Mapu y nuestro chavo que los ilumina, vamos a decir, Marichi Huevo, y la tierra será recuperada. Marichi Huevo. For more on global justice ecology projects work in Chile, including powerful images by Orrin Langell, visit globaljusticeecology.org. Now, speaking of false solutions, by now most people don't actually think that fracking is some kind of necessary bridge to sustainable energy. Those interested in building green energy infrastructure seem pretty aware that fracking is horrifically pollutive and destructive. Still, when we talk about fracking, we rarely have ever talk about frac sand mining. Indeed, most folks, including myself, didn't even know what the hell frac sand mining was until well after I knew about fracking. Here to unveil the mystery and dig into this seldom discussed necessary evil of fracking is Ted Ock, Great Lakes Program Coordinator for Frac Tracker. Take a look. This is largely driven by the industry, and then they fed that into the media, and the media has kind of lapped it up, unfortunately. And so they've run with this idea that fracking is just a couple of well, not a couple, thousands of well pads across the country and really fallen short in identifying the whole cradle to grave ecosystem that is fracking to include the sand mining. And also sand mining is not happening most of the time. It's not happening in places where fracking is happening and it's happening in very rural, uh, kind of largely well, in Wisconsin, where I've worked quite a bit, it's a dairy farming com country. So it's just a different environment, a different group of people. And they have, um, you don't have a lot of activism going on around it. So there's just all of those, re all of those uh, kind of lend to why it doesn't get much um, press. But the primary reason is that the industry has been driving this decoupling of what they do and how we define them in a really kind of coordinated way. And it's, it's, it's actually pretty brilliant, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think one of the things is that, you, you know, you mentioned the drill pads and when you see a drill pad, it's a pretty like small footprint. It doesn't look like much, but, you know, frac sand mining, the pictures, uh, it's like strip mining. It's this huge yeah. swath of land that's just been completely torn apart. Um, and you mentioned, you know, this is taking place in, in, this, in, the, in the Midwest predominantly. And it's, it's not just a matter of like pulling sand out of the ground. Uh, talk about the, the process of this and the environmental impacts. Yeah, I mean, your analogy to strip mining and mountaintop removal is really similar. It's just there aren't any mountains. So they're not, they don't have to remove any mountains. But, but indeed, a lot of what I've seen in Wisconsin is, um, and what you hear in Wisconsin is that as I said, there's a lot of farmers out there and whenever they have slopes or what they call bluffs that are more than 20% slope, that's something they can't farm. So what the industry has done really, again, brilliantly is they've gone into farmers and said, listen, 
you know that 15 acre bluff that you have on your property well we could chop that up take the sand out and then level it and then you could use it again so it's that's a selling point to the mining sorry to the to the agricultural sector um, and what you end up seeing is just big holes in the ground that never get reclaimed uh, and again this gets back to I was a when I was a graduate student at Virginia Tech we saw a lot of this with coal mining whereby there are all these amazing kind of bells and whistles proclamations being made for what they could do with the land once it was mined. And then at the end of the day, oh, wow, we don't have any money left. We're insolvent. Uh, we can pay off our bond, but that's a very minimum. We, that's the maximum we can do. Uh, sorry. You know, and then, then, then what, what do you have? You just have these open pits or what you have is sterile sand sitting, sitting on the, you know, on these large acreages where the topsoil was never, um, partitioned so the key would always be to take your topsoil put it off to the side and then put that back on top because that would give you some seed bed and some fertility but that never happens and what you end i mean i have not seen one case of success quote unquote of reclamation on a sand mine they're always end up left being just you know left to have the sand just fly all over the place so you know i mean what you hear from the counties and from the industry is we can obtain or at least come close to a close approximation of what was there before, but that's, we've never seen that. So. And of course the other issue here is that, you know, when you destroy the environment like this, you can't, you can never put it back the way it was. No. Like that's not, right. it's not a, you know, it's not like a Lego set. It's not like, Oh, I destroyed that. Now I can build it back the exact same way that it was. Uh, yeah. And in particular, the, the issue of silica here, talk about the, like the specifics of that as in, in terms of uh, destruction, both in, environmentally, but for public health. Yeah. So there's a lot of work that's gone, well, not a lot, uh, a very small lab at the university of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, a guy named Chris Pierce has done, he's been basically the only person that's done any work on this. And he has a really small lab with a very small budget. But what he has demonstrated is that uh, silica dust, PM 2.5 and, and PM 1. So that's um, particle size 2.5 or lower. These are really fine grains. This is not sand that you even see on your beach. This is like, take a, take a grain of sand you see on your beach and then crush that. That's what you're talking about. So this stuff is gets it gets in the air and it can fly. And the the PM1, which is the really nasty, really small stuff, goes really far distances. And what he uh, has demonstrated, again, this is a small sample size. It's probably three or four mines that he's looked at. Is two things happen. One is they're never they, if they say they're going to keep their sand wet, that is to spray it. Uh, they never do that. So that's one thing that happens, or they never say that and they're never required to do that. And that creates these huge piles of sand, really fine sand all over Western Wisconsin and central Illinois and some other places. And that stuff can go for miles. But the other thing to, to mention here is, is that that's just at the mine site and around the mine site, this sand ends up going by barge or by train to all of the shale plays in North Dakota and Texas and here in Ohio and West Virginia. And then once it gets there, as we see outside of Pittsburgh, they put them in these rail offloading terminals. And that same sand is sitting in really high population density areas just outside of Pittsburgh. So now that dust is, is uh, being foisted on those kinds of communities. Okay, so now you have that. So now you have communities where the stuff is being mined. You have the communities where it's being offloaded. And then you have the workers, for better or worse, who are not protecting themselves or being required to protect themselves when that stuff is being taken from those offloading terminals to the site itself. And then it gets to the site, and then we all know that the, you know that same silica dust is spreading all over there. So you have this chain of custody where at each step, more and more of this material, well, significant chunks of this material is just spreading all over the place. And this gets in your lungs, and this causes silicosis, and we know this to be a very big deal. Um, silicosis can be a very, I mean, it can be terminal. Um, but again, it's a very poorly, com poorly understood component of fracking itself is the role of silica dust on the people around where this stuff is being moved and processed. And just so fo fo folks understand, what is the role of sand in the fracking process? Right. So it's, a, it's that's the, probably the critical question. And this has been what, what, what we've been working on quite a bit, which is the oil and gas industry calls the sand propping. And when they call it propping, that means that when they go in and they fracture the rock and they're pulling gas out of the, the seams, you know, we're primarily dealing with gas where I live. When they, when they fracture it, when they frack it, 
they got to pull the gas out. And in order to pull the gas out, you need some porous medium where you can pull the stuff through, right? I mean, if it's solid rock, you can't pull anything through. You need like a sponge that you can replace that fractured rock with because you're pulling the rock out that you cracked and you're replacing it with sand. And so basically take, for example, you take a solid piece of material, you crack it, you pull all that material out and you replace it with something that can maintain that opening, but all the while be porous enough so you can pull the gas out. So that's what they're using the sand for is to, as a kind of a, a placeholder, if you will, for the rock that they took out. And then that can get the gas out. And then the thing that's important for that perspective is that it used to be that the industry was using about, oh, uh, 150 to 250 to 300 tons of sand uh, per well, per oil and gas lateral. And what we've seen in Ohio and in other states is the laterals are getting longer. They're using more and more sand. Right now we have wells that are going to be requiring 25,000 tons of sand. So you can see these orders of magnitude shifts in what they need. And the reason that's critical for your audience and for others to understand is that basically you have what you get when you, you know, you have what you're pulling out of the ground and you have what you put down into the ground to get that stuff. And that ratio of those two things is going through the roof. That is to say, the input to output ratio for this whole thing is just going totally out of whack. And it really started off in a bad place and it's getting worse. And that's that means that for every unit of gas that we're getting now, I mean, I can't even do the math in my head right now, but you know, it's let's say there was five tons of sand used for a unit of gas. I'm just throwing a number out there. That number is now 35 and 40 tons of sand. So that ratio is the critical thing. And that gets to the major take home point, which is that wherever you have sand mining going on right now, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And what we need to do is focus on those communities and lend them the support that they need, both academic and kind of just, you know, venues like this to get the word out to say, look, you have to understand that fracking is, again, getting back to the original question, it's not just pads, it's injection wells, it's pipelines, it's all of this stuff. So. And do you know, because uh, obviously one of the things with fracking is as how detrimental it can be to the groundwater and uh, and things like that. Is there any evidence to show that once the silica sand is placed in the ground, that it can uh, it can have an effect on on the on the ground where it sits? Uh, the more more of the impact that we're seeing with regard to silica sand and its chemical impact on on water, like water quality, kind of I think is your question, is when you mine the stuff at the site or you're separating out. So you have these grain sizes of sand. So you use the finer, use the coarser grain at the beginning of the lateral and as it goes further and further out, and as remember, as I mentioned, they're getting longer and longer. As you go further and further out, they're using finer and finer grains of sand. Well, that stuff has to be separated out prior to getting to the site. And it's usually separated at these terminals in the mine communities themselves. In order to separate that stuff out, you have to use really toxic, toxic chemicals, not only to separate out the grain sizes, but to separate out the silts and the clays, which they don't want, from the good stuff, the sand that they do want. In order to do that, they use acrylamides and polyacrylamides, which are cancer-causing agents. And basically what those do is they help the settling out process. So they can, you can add a bunch of that stuff to your mixture, to your slurry, and you can remove the silicas, the silts and the clays and just get out your sands. And that's what they're using to do that. And therein lies the issue in my opinion as to impacts on people with from a water quality standpoint because that stuff those systems where they're mining and separating out this stuff are far from tight they leak all over the place and when they leak you know chances are though that stuff is getting out into the waterways and this you know the the surface waters uh but the state of wisconsin as an example in illinois where it's also being mined really bad data on that if it exists at all so from my reading of things the water quality impact is primarily at the mining and processing um, point sources themselves not so much at the fracking because once it's gotten to the fracking site the issues are more with the fracking chemicals not the sand itself with regard to water quality and so talk about um like with these sites in Wisconsin in particular and, and other places in the Midwest, what are the effects on the, the farming communities? You know, you mentioned dairy farms, like animals and plants. What are, what's happening? Uh, interestingly enough, I was at a, I was at a conference in Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, 
I think four or five years ago, it was Healing Our Waters Conference, which the Great Lakes Protection Fund puts on, and it was in Grand Rapids. Um, again, I think it was four or five years ago, something around there. And we presented a, a, we gave a talk on sand mining, and a gentleman came up to me from Wisconsin, and he was telling me he's doing a lot of really progressive stuff on nutrient loading and reducing the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that come from farms in Wisconsin by way of manure and grazing and that kind of thing. So kind of getting back to the original way that animals were raised. And uh, he told me kind of, you know, off mic, like he said, one of the things that's most concerning about sand mining is that it's really imbued in the communities, this sense of we can get rich quick. And it's caused a lot of the people that were otherwise really receptive to what he was pushing, these progressive ways to farm and to raise animals. They were just saying to hell with it. We can get rich. So we're not doing any of that. So you're really undermining some local grassroots like really progressive agricultural processes. Um, it's having a, it, uh, the impact that it's having on farming, I th we think right now is largely, um, is largely a water quantity thing, not a water quality thing. That is to say, these high capacity wells that all these mines rely on to, to, to process their sand are having huge impacts on, on subsurface water. And the links between whether Joe Schmo farmer next to this mine has to jig a new well and whether that was caused by these groundwater aquifer depletions hard to make yeah. and they're anecdotal you know they're qualitative right now but again this isn't we're a small nonprofit and we don't have the resources to do that kind of work it's really should be up to the states of wisconsin and others to do this heavy lifting they haven't done it but i think they know they need to start doing it but i think one of the big things that, that we're seeing is, is that farmers are worried not just about they're worried about water ground, uh, sorry, groundwater depletion, the impacts of the silica coming over onto their crops or whatever they happen to be doing, and the impacts. Oh well, I should mention one, which is probably one of the more disturbing ones. Is we we know a farmer in um, Jackson County or Monroe County, Wisconsin. He's a bee farmer. His name is Mark Settlebauer, and he uh, he's been raising beef for multiple generations, and he always had about four or five percent mortality on his herd every year and a mine just moved in by just i mean four years ago moved in next to his his property and now he 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 experiences 20 percent mortality in his herd so these are real concrete impacts from a day-to-day -day basis on it the market you know you know how the, i mean we all know that farmers operate on a thin margin as is so these kinds of nicks in their in their profit margin are put are going to put a lot of them out of business and there's also the, uh, I, I believe it was on Frack Tracker that I read about the explosions and the sound that are part of this as well, which is part, like, I remember talking to folks that live close to a mountaintop removal, you know, they had chicken farms and the chickens stopped laying because they were so stressed by what was happening. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think that getting back to the, to the beef farmer, I think there's a huge, again, hard to quantify, but I shouldn't say hard to quantify, probably easy to quantify, but not being done. Uh, impact on the yeah the emotional experience of these animals and and uh, I think that one of the mortality things that this farmer was talking about was again the dust but also just yes the constant explosions I mean and again when these guys are going full bore I mean it's two a day you know and I mean these are seismic I'm not maybe that's putting it a little bit too dramatically but these are big time explosions um, and uh, especially if they're taking off those bluffs, like I mentioned, if they're going down into the ground, it's a little less so, but if they got to blow up a side, side of a bluff, I mean, they're going, they're going crazy. And, and we see this in, uh, for example, the community of Toma, Wisconsin, where they're taking bluffs off all over the place. Um, yeah, I mean, the explosions are a huge deal. Um, and the only, th the, the thing that really were, that drives folks crazy is they get these 24 hour notices that it like between 12 and four the next day, we're going to be blowing it up. Or sorry, that's not how it's phrased on the phone call. Between 12 and four tomorrow, we are in the process of thinking about whether we're going to blow up. So they live that next 24 hours oh, just God. anticipation. And then that, that period comes around and it doesn't happen. And you can imagine just sitting there, you know, like with your knuckles, biting your knuckles, and then it doesn't happen. I mean, that's no way to live. So yeah, all those things. Yeah, and, the, and with the silicosis, as I understand it, a lot of this is like long term. So you, it's hard to say, like because the it has to build up, and then maybe ten years from now you have lung cancer, or or or, or COPD or something like that. So it's a it's the long term effect as well. It's not an immediate 
uh, immediate thing always. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the acute and chronic effects are, are definitely, I mean, they're ubiquitous and um, that's, that's been something that, again, most of what Frag Tracker does is, I mean, most of what I do is I do a lot of photography and I do a lot of documenting the stories of people. And I should add, there's two other components of this thing that is really, I think, interesting and also kind of disturbing is that in many of these communities where sand mining is going on, the only thing standing between the sand mining industry and a complete landscape alteration for forever is the Amish farmers that live there. So Amish farmers have held out and they will hold out. And they've always said that, you know, there's not enough money in it for us. Well, there's no there's no money you could give us because, I mean, they always look at us like you and me and others. As, you know, they call us English and they say, we don't understand why you all pit each other against each other. You know, like we're all in it together. It's really refreshing and, and, un, and unfortunate at the same time. But so it's, it's these Amish communities. And, you know, I mean, they still live by they live in a different way of life. And when you have all this mining going on with all this truck traffic going at such a heavy rate. It, it, they are incredibly stressed. Um, and then there's another community that's also um, pushing back against this heavily, and that's the Ho-Chunk Nation up in western Wisconsin. They are not, they don't have um, tribal lands per se. They have a very diffuse uh, land ownership uh, structure in, up in western Wisconsin, but the Ho-Chunk tribe has been pushing back quite a bit. And they large sections of their tribe are about to break, I think, unfortunately. But those two sections of Western Wisconsin um, have been pretty much the only thing standing between Western Wisconsin and this kind of complete, you know, irreversible landscape change. For more on Ted's work in frack sand mining, as well as the entire fracking industry as a whole, visit fracktracker.org. And that will do it for this week's Dose of Descent. Next week, we're airing our Best of 2019 episode, so definitely tune in for that. The following week, we'll be off before diving headfirst into the new year. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to sign up for our newsletter, and if you can, donate to keep the show going. From the Devil's Den, good night and act out. And real quick, to keep independent, non-corporatized media like this show going, visit patreon.com slash act out. I'm not a violent man, but I